use the divergence theorem to compute the net outward flux of the vector field defined by the components x squared, y squared, z squared across the surface S, where S is the sphere centered at the origin with a radius of 3. So using our given vector field here, let's jump right in and compute the divergence. So we want the divergence of our vector field, which we know is defined as the dot product of the del operator with that vector field. So we have the del operator d dx, d dy, d dz. And we're dotting this with our vector field x squared, y squared, z squared. And so this by the dot product becomes the derivative of x squared with respect to x plus the derivative of y squared with respect to y plus the derivative of z squared with respect to z. And this leaves us with 2x plus 2y plus 2z. So this is the divergence of our vector field. So we do not have a constant here, so we're not going to be able to use that shortcut. So we want to think about what are the bounds of our solid region? So we want to determine the bounds on D. In R3. So looking back up at our given question here, we know that the solid region is bounded by the sphere. And we know that this sphere has a radius of 3. So thinking about triple integrals. If we have a solid region that is a sphere, it's going to be easiest to use spherical coordinates. So we need the bounds for spherical coordinates. And we have a full sphere here, so we can go right, right for it. We can say that since the radius of this sphere is 3, this lets us know that the row bounds, rho is always greater than or equal to zero, and since rho is the radius of the sphere, this will be less than or equal to three. And because we have a full sphere, we know that the bounds on phi and theta will be the standard bounds. We know that the bounds on phi, though, bounds from the positive z-axis. So we say that phi is greater than or equal to 0, less than or equal to pi. And we can say that theta is going to be greater than or equal to 0, less than or equal to 2 pi. Because again, we have a full circle or a full sphere. So here are the bounds on rho theta phi. Now looking back up at our divergence, we realize that we're going to need to rewrite the divergence of the vector field in terms of rho, theta, and phi. So just as a friendly reminder, let's quickly recall the conversion formulas for spherical coordinates. So we know that x is equivalent to rho times sine of phi times cosine of theta. We know that y is equal to rho sine of phi sine of theta. And we know that z is equal to rho times cosine of phi. So we're going to use these conversion formulas to parameterize the divergence of the vector field. So we have that the divergence of our vector field is again equal to 2x plus 2y plus 2z. And we want to replace x, y, and z with rho theta phi. And just for safety, let's give ourselves plenty of room so we can say that this is equal to 2 multiplied by rho sine of phi cosine of theta plus 2 
rho times sine of phi, sine of theta, and last but not least, plus 2 rho cosine of phi. So we can actually even move this over a little bit. Oh, not too far, though. So do we have a greatest common factor? Sure do. Let's pull out that two row. Again, just to make our integration a little bit easier. So this is two row multiplied by sine of phi cosine of theta plus sine of phi sine of theta plus cosine of phi. And so this is the parameterized divergence of the vector field. So we have the necessary bounds, and we have the parameterized divergence of the vector field. So we are officially ready to set up the triple integral for the divergence theorem. So here we go. We're ready to evaluate the triple integral of the divergence theorem. So plugging in everything that we just found, we have our theta bounds are from 0 to 2 pi. The phi bounds are from 0 to pi. The row bounds are from 0 to 3, and we found the parameterized divergence of our vector field to be 2 rho multiplied by sine of phi cosine of theta plus sine of phi sine of theta plus cosine of phi. And don't forget here, the differential in spherical coordinates is slightly different. We know that that's defined as rho squared sine of phi. Oh, we almost had it. D rho, d phi, d theta. Whew. So there we go. And we can actually simplify this a tiny bit further. We have that greatest common factor rho that we pulled out of the divergence of our vector field and the rho squared of the differential. So this is going to be 2 times the integral from 0 to 2 pi, the integral from 0 to pi, the integral from 0 to 3 of sine of phi cosine of theta plus sine of phi sine of theta plus cosine of phi. And this is now rho cubed sine of phi d rho d phi d theta. Whew. So here we go. We're ready to integrate. Now just for convenience, I'm going to leave all of this where it is because we're integrating with respect to rho first. So I'm just going to pull out the inner integral here. And we're thinking about 2 times the integral from 0 to 3 of rho cubed d rho. And this, of course, is going to integrate to rho to the fourth over 4. But because we have that 2 in the front, it's rho to the fourth divided by 2 from 0 to 3. And so we have 1 half multiplied by 3 to the 4th minus 0. And this leaves us with 81 halves. So there is our inner integral. So our middle integral here is with respect to phi. So we've got to plug everything back in. And I'm going to take away my star so that we have more room. So this is equal to to be 81 halves on the outside. We are evaluating the middle integral from 0 to pi of sine of phi cosine of theta plus sine of phi sine of theta plus cosine of phi and that is all multiplied by sine of phi, d phi. So we need to distribute our sine of phi through to each term. So 
So we have 81 halves times the integral from 0 to pi. And let's actually note here before we go, just for simplicity, if we look at these first two terms here, notice that they have a greatest common factor of sine of phi. So we can think about this as sine of phi multiplied by cosine of theta plus sine of theta. So then when we go through and distribute, we're only distributing to one term instead of, well, we're distributing to two terms technically. This one being the first, and this one being our second. So, again, we have the integral for 81 halves times the integral from 0 to pi of, so keep this cosine of theta plus sine of theta out in the front, and that is now multiplied by sine of phi times sine of phi, so sine of phi squared plus sine of phi times cosine of phi, d phi. And so we have some nice simplification here. We're going to need to use the half angle formula. So our half angle formula. And then in the second term, we're gonna to need to use the double angle formula. So we can rewrite this as 81 halves times the integral from 0 to pi of cosine of theta plus sine of theta. And then we're converting sine squared to the half angle formula. So you can think about this as 1 half multiplied by 1 minus cosine of 2 phi. And then our double angle formula here, this is going to be plus one half sine of two phi, d phi. So we have a greatest common factor of one half that we can pull out just to make this a little bit easier to deal with, or you can just go for it. So I'm pulling that, co that greatest common factor of one half out of each term here. So we're left with 81 fourths times the integral from zero to pi of cosine of theta plus sine of theta multiplied by one minus cosine of two phi, which is a general antiderivative, plus sine of two phi, which is another general antiderivative. Thank goodness. And so we're ready to integrate. This is 81 fourths. multiplied by cosine of theta plus sine of theta, and then one becomes theta, and we have minus sine of two phi divided by two plus, or excuse me, minus cosine of two phi divided by two. And we're evaluating now from zero to pi. So we have 81 fourths multiplied by cosine of theta plus sine of theta. And we're evaluating first at pi, so this will be multiplied by pi minus sine of 2 pi is 0. So that'll be 0 over 2 minus cosine of 2 pi, which we can, we know cosine of 2 pi is going to 1, so this becomes 1 half. And now we want to do the same thing, but with 0. So this is going to leave us with minus, so we still have this cosine of theta plus sine of theta, and this will be multiplied by 0 Minus sine of zero is just zero, phew. Minus cosine of zero, which will go to one, so we have minus one half. Phew. So what is this leaving us with? 
We have, and now we can give ourselves some more room here. We have 81 fourths multiplied by, we have pi times cosine of theta plus sine of theta, and that's minus one half. And then since this is being multiplied by zero, this whole thing disappears. Just don't forget this negative multiplied by a negative will produce a positive one half. So these two cancel each other out to zero. And we are left now with 81 pi by four multiplied by cosine of theta plus sine of theta. So it reduced down to something nice. And we're officially ready to evaluate that outer integral, which is from 0 to 2 pi. So this is 81 pi divided by 4 multiplied by cosine of theta plus sine of theta, which are both general antiderivatives. So we can say that this is equal to 81 pi divided by 4 multiplied by we know that cosine of theta integrates to sine of theta, sine of theta integrates to minus cosine of theta, and it's now safe to evaluate from zero to two pi. So we have 81 times pi divided by four multiplied by sine of two pi, which goes to zero, minus cosine of two pi goes to one, minus sine of zero goes to zero, and cosine of zero goes to one. So we have a negative multiplied by a negative, so we are left with 81 pi divided by four, multiplied by negative one plus one, which goes to zero. And so we're left with a beautiful final answer of Zero.